Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time, let's talk spot metering. In my experience, both in one-on-one -on -one conversations and in workshops, I've discovered that spot metering is one of the most misunderstood metering patterns and that most people are actually using it wrong. Let's take a look at how it really works and when to use it. But before we jump in, remember that if you would like to continue to see content like this, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. Now, hold your breath. This is going to be a deep dive. Spot meter size and position. First, what is spot metering? Spot metering takes a meter reading off of a very small portion of the frame, ignoring the rest. I'd love to give you the specifics, but the size of the spot meter area varies quite a bit between brands and even sometimes between cameras within that brand. As a very general guideline, the typical spot metering area is usually about 1.5% of the viewfinder to 5% of the viewfinder, although some cameras allow you to customize the size and go significantly larger than that. Next is spot meter position, and that, once again, can vary wildly. Some cameras, like Nikon, link spot metering to the active AF point. Others spot meter only from the center. Still others, like some Canon and Sony models, allow you to link the AF points as an option. Once again, there's just too many brands and models to cover them all, so consult your owner's manual to see your options. That said, if you are a Nikon shooter, make sure you check out my exposure and metering book for Nikon. It does cover all of this in much greater detail. Now, there is a pitfall here, too. If you do link your AF points to the spot meter area, or if they are permanently linked like we have with Nikon, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking the spot meter area is the same size as an AF point, and that's usually not the case. Here's an approximation with a typical Nikon DSLR. As you can see, the spot meter is significantly larger than the AF point. One way to sort of get a feel for this is to spot meter off of a plain background with a strong light source in it. Move the spot meter towards the light source and note when the light source starts to influence the meter. At any rate, the biggest place the spot meter size gets you into trouble is if you think the spot meter is much smaller than it really is and it's seeing a lot of the background and maybe that background happens to be really bright or really dark. I used this image in my last video covering Nikon metering tips, but it applies here as well. In this case, the spot meter would see a lot of background behind the bird, and because that background is dark, it would likely result in an overexposure. How the spot meter thinks. One of the biggest problems with spot metering is that when people first discover it, they believe they just struck photographic gold. Put the spot meter on your subject and you'll get a perfect exposure every time, right? Plus, with most cameras, you can link spot metering to the AF point, so as long as your AF point is on the subject, which, you know what, usually is, metering becomes a non-issue, right? If that's how you perceive spot metering, you're not alone. In fact, from my own experience, you're actually in the majority. However, I have some bad news. That's not how it works. What spot metering does is to try to render the brightness level of whatever is under the metering area a perfect middle tone like this gray card you see here. If your subject happens to have about that same amount of reflectance as that gray card, you're golden. And luckily, that's often the case for the wildlife photographers that frequent this channel. However, if your subject happens to reflect more or less than the gray card, you can run into trouble. To illustrate this point, I did a simple little setup in my backyard with three different metering targets. One was white, one was black, and one was gray. Then I spot metered off of each one and took a photo. Let's look at the results. Okay, so our first shot here is just of a gray card taped to a little sign I made. And in this case, F11 ISO 400 is what I picked. I had the camera in aperture priority, so it picked 1 of a second, and it resulted in a perfect exposure. It was a cloudy day, so the sky should be white like that. The goldenrod looks good, the vegetation looks good, and more importantly, the histogram looks good. So using a middle tone target with a spot meter results in a perfect exposure. Not a big surprise there. Now let's look what happens with the black target. When I tape the black target there and did the exact same thing, again, letting the camera do its thing, 1 30th of a second, that's a two stop overexposure when I was trying to meter off of this darker target, this black target. Finally, we have our white target, and as you can see, that resulted in a severe underexposure. We're at 1 640th of a second, which is 2.3 stops darker than it should be, so the white target was not doing us any favors when we were spot metering. So obviously sticking our spot metering area on our target is not a surefire way to guarantee we'll have a perfect exposure every time. The trick here is that our spot meter has no idea what it's looking at. 
All it can do is render whatever is under it as middle tone. When you feed it something like a black sheet of paper, it sees very low reflectance. So just ask yourself, if you wanted to brighten a black piece of paper enough to turn it middle gray and your only tool was light, what would you do? You'd add more light, right? On the other hand, when the spot meter sees white, it sees a lot of reflectance. So once again, how would you make something white into middle tone gray if your only tool was light intensity? Exactly, you take light away, and that's exactly what the spot meter is doing here. In fact, if we convert our images to black and white and compare the target area in each photo, we discover that they are all rendered as middle tone. And yes, the black target does have some texture to it, but you can see that the tonalities are all the same. Of course, the tonalities that fall in between these extremes of black and white we just saw will be closer to rendering a correct exposure, but they will never be perfect unless they are reflecting the same light as a middle tone target. Now that we know that the spot meter is always trying to make whatever is under it middle tone, we can use that to our advantage. Using the spot meter, middle tones. Once you know how the spot meter thinks, using it is pretty straightforward. The simplest way to use it is to meter off of a middle toned area of the scene that's in the same light as your subject. Or if your subject is actually middle toned like many of my wildlife subjects, you can just actually meter right off of them. If you're in an auto exposure mode, once you have a good meter reading, use your auto exposure lock button to hold the exposure as you shoot if necessary. Be careful here too. If you don't lock in your exposure and you happen to recompose, the spot meter will take a reading from the new location and that can cause a change in exposure depending on where it lands. The good news is that most cameras will have some sort of AE lock button or at least allow you to program a button for AE lock. By the way, if your AE lock button also locks in focus, you may want to change it to just AE lock. That way, once the exposure is locked, you can still change focus if necessary. Of course, if you're in full manual mode, just meter off a middle tone area that's in the same light as your subject or the subject itself if that subject happens to be middle tone. Then set your exposure so your meter is zeroed out and fire away. In fact, Full manual mode is my preferred exposure mode whenever I'm using a spot meter. By the way, many cameras allow you to assign spot metering to a custom button. This comes in really handy for when you need it in a hurry, and I do recommend that you go ahead and set that if you have it as an option. Spot metering without a middle tone area. So what happens if you want a spot meter but you can't find one of those handy middle tone targets to meter off of that I keep talking about? Simple, meter off of anything and then just compensate. Since we understand how the spot meter thinks, it's easy to know when it's likely to make a mistake. For example, if we meter off of a white subject, like our target from earlier, we know 100% that it's going to underexpose. That doesn't mean we can't meter off that target, it just means that we have to outthink the meter. We know that when it sees the white target, it's going to decrease exposure to make it middle gray. In this case, the white paper is about two and a third stops brighter than middle tone. So to use it as a metering target, all I have to do is add two and a third stops to my exposure. If I'm in an auto exposure mode, I can use exposure compensation. If I'm in manual, I can just make sure my meter is indicating a 2.3 stop overexposure. When I snap the photo with the exposure adjusted to compensate for the spot meters under exposure, I get a perfectly exposed image as you see here. For this example, I added 2.3 stops to my exposure compensation while in aperture priority and then it just popped off the shot. No surprise, the camera picked the same 1 25th of a second that it used when shooting that gray card. By the way, that 2.3 stop difference will apply across the board if we want to use the white target for metering. I could take that white target anywhere, meter off of it, add 2.3 stops, and get a perfect exposure every time. And of course, the same works for darker subjects, just in reverse, we dial in under exposure, as shown with this image here. The trick to really getting the most from your spot meter is to learn what middle tone looks like and knowing how much to compensate when you can't meter off of a middle tone target. One great way to shorten that learning curve is to simply walk around your neighborhood or even your backyard, spot meter objects of varying tonality, compensate for those tonalities, pop off a shot, and see how close you are to a proper exposure, and you can verify that with your histogram. With a little practice, you'll be able to spot meter off of any target, compensate if needed, and get a perfect exposure every time. So far, we've been metering just single tonalities, but keep in mind, you'll often encounter mixed tonalities like we have here with this toucan. When this happens, the spot meter basically averages everything out, 
And depending on the situation, it often actually works well. In this case, we have the dark eye, beak, and a little black feather area under the spot meter, but that's offset by the lighter than middle tone yellow area. Everything is lighter or darker than middle tone, but they all balance out for a good exposure. Where you can get into trouble here is if you have mixed tonalities under the spot meter, but as a group, all of those tonalities are either lighter than or darker than middle tone, then you'll need to compensate. When to use and not use spot metering. At this point, you may be wondering if you should use spot metering all the time, part time, or not at all. Well, only you can decide that. I'll tell you what I do. Personally, for my wildlife work, Matrix gets it right most of the time. I can show you shot after shot after shot where Matrix just nailed it. No muss, no fuss. For a typical scene like you see in these images, it just works. The thing is, spot metering requires a bit more work on my part, and I tend to go the quickest route I can most of the time, and Matrix gets it close enough in the majority of cases. As a side note, I also tend to avoid combining spot metering with action and auto exposure. It's just too easy for the spot meter to slip off an active target onto a background that would ruin the exposure. Now, let's look at a few examples of when I typically turn to my spot meter. The first hint that I may want to spot meter is that I'm facing a contrasty scene with lots of light and dark areas. When you're dealing with splotchy light like that, the matrix and multi-pattern meters of the world are often too hit and miss, getting it right on one shot and then messing it up on the next one. If I have a lot of mixed light in a scene, I'll consider spot metering the target, setting in the correct exposure using the techniques we just covered, and then locking it in. From there, I can fire away and as long as the light doesn't change, I'll get great exposures shot after shot. Another pair of common scenarios where I turn to spot metering are scenes with strong backlight and scenes with a bright subject against a really dark background. In these scenarios, matrix and multi-pattern metering will often be fooled by the background and give us an unsatisfactory exposure for our subject. For example, take this kingfisher. It's against an incredibly dark background and matrix metering completely blew it out. Spot metering the bird produced a much more accurate result. Same applies to this baboon with a bright light behind him. It was a nightmare for matrix metering, but spot metering right on the eyes rendered a good exposure for the monkey. Spot metering is also handy in even light where the subject is middle tone, but the rest of the scene is like really dark or really light. Winter snow scenes are a great example of this since matrix and segmented metering tend to underexpose in that scenario. For this dove, there was a lot of snow in the scene and the camera wanted to underexpose. Spot metering for the dove rendered a proper exposure. Of course, I could also get the same result with matrix or multi-pattern metering and a little exposure compensation too. So the trick is you just got to pick which seems best for the situation at hand. The real key to becoming proficient with a spot meter is just to go out and practice. You won't always be perfect, but you can definitely get to the point where you're very close most of the time. Also, if you're a Nikon shooter, check out my ebook, Secrets to Exposure and Metering for Nikon. It covers everything you'd ever want to know about every exposure and metering option on your Nikon camera, as well as giving you tons of examples for how each mode works and, more importantly, when to use it. The thing is, most people never really master their exposure controls and their metering options and adjustments. Don't let that happen to you. This book will get you over the finish line. As always, stop by the site and check out what's new in the forums. Always a ton of great questions and answers going on there. I also post tips that are just for the forum, so if you like my content, you'll enjoy the forum too. Also, make sure you stop by the site and check out all of my blog posts, videos, and more, and sign up for that free email newsletter so you never miss a thing. Finally, I'd love it if you'd like, subscribe, and get notified. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.